Oh, you guys know what's going on. You heard the tunes, and you know that we're back again for another episode of the MLB Baseball Scout Podcast. And I've heard from the scouts on the street that a lot of scouts watch the show. Well, man, thank you guys for hanging out with Tim Wilkin. I'm just the guy that guides Tim through uh, the questions that we're trying to come to the answer to on this show uh, each and every episode. And that's what do these scouts do? and his perspective on things going on in the world of scouting. So the Super Bowl, Tim, of scouting just finished up, and the Super Bowl of scouting is the draft, the MLB draft. And as a scouting director for the Cubs and other teams, you've been there and done that, and uh, here we are. Now we get to evaluate the draft. God bless you, Mick. Uh, yeah, it, it, it was a pure pleasure. Uh, doing it as long as I did, and it was always, you know, everyone was excited inside the system, especially the area scouts, regional guys, and national guys. And it was always good to get together and uh, spend a lot of days in those rooms. So it was uh, quite the pleasure and quite the rush. Well, you don't really know how well you did until – you know, years down the road. And the toughest part for scouting is, and we're going to get into the Cub Scout right out of the chute, right? Uh, and guys, this is episode 18, I believe, of the MLB Baseball Scout podcast, um, is that you really, you once you get the guys, you depend on the development system to develop them, right? So Sometimes you could draft somebody really good and they just mess up the development. And, and, and that's why it's kind of the same guy oversees both of them, right? Because you got to draft, but then you have to develop and you got to care about both of those things. Yeah, it's kind of merging the scouts' thoughts on those particular players that they did draft and then player development trying to take it uh, to the next level for those players. So, it's uh, it, sometimes uh, yeah, you see, I won't say instantaneous because Paul Skeens is a freak in the sense that he got the big leagues pretty quick. Uh, same way with Nolan Shanuel, the first baseman of the Angels. Uh, but you don't see that much. So you're basically looking anywhere from a three to five year period. But you have some guys that hung on, and there was a particular guy. I, you might have uh, had him at Knoxville, Taylor Scott. And Taylor Scott was a fifth rounder by the Cubs in 2011. He kicked around quite a while and looks like he's making some inroads at the age of 32. He was a fifth round, so you don't see the final product right away with a lot of these players. Right. Right. And that's, that's the toughest part about doing this because, uh, you know, you, it takes a while to go from college to the major leagues and then stay in the major leagues. But let's, let's look at the, um, the Cubs draft. Let's just start there. I'm going to put it up on the board here. MLB.com. Uh, <laughs> first pick was Cam Smith, Cole Mathis, so you got a third baseman. They list Mathis as a third baseman, but I think he played first base too. Ronnie Cruz, who's a, Flor a Floridian like you uh, from the Miami area, uh, a guy who loves Manny Machado and uh, that, that that kind of that Dominican shortstop uh, bunch that's so good in the big leagues. Uh, and then down the line, but four, the first four picks were um, you know infielders and then a catcher which the Cubs desperately need someone to kind of do that, then a pitcher, then an outfielder, then a first baseman, and another pitcher, and then um, a third baseman. Uh, third baseman. Yeah, so the first 10 picks, you only got two pitchers. You got a lot of infielders and a lot of college hitters. And I, I felt like this, Tim, and I'm going to let you talk on it, but I felt like the Cubs were going, okay, we – have this group of guys that are triple a double a and big leagues that are kind of all young that are kind of getting there. And by taking a lot of like college hitters that they feel like those guys have a better chance of catching up with that group. Is that, am I off on that? 
Not particularly. Uh, it just there might be some position switches with those everyday players. So that'll be time for them to acclimate themselves to new positions, possibly. And uh, like like you said earlier, eight of those guys were everyday players. Two pitchers, I believe one was left-handed, and uh, the other guy was right-handed, naturally. But uh, it uh, they went for some more pitchers between 11 and 20. But... Uh, <clears throat> It'll be interesting to see because it looks like they got a little more athletic in their draft. I've seen Smith in the past from Florida State, and I think he's still putting his body control together a little bit, uh, not so unlike uh, Alex Bone. And uh, <clears throat> it'll be interesting to watch his progress through the years. What'd you think about that first round pick? Another Floridian, right? A guy that played at Florida State. Third baseman, they like his, you know, the analytics. They like his barrel rate. You know, they like the the power mm -hmm. that he possesses. He walks a lot. And, um, you know, he's someone that the Cubs feel like, I, I don't know position-wise. It's hard to really, for me, to evaluate anyone without really seeing them play. But just from what I've read and what I've watched and clips and stuff, they feel like he's got the potential to be a guy that could hit 30 home runs. Well, uh, and I won't put that whammy on him, but uh, I, I think there's some power in there. I think he's got some uh, pull to right center field abilities with pop, uh, pretty good hands. And like I said, it's a, it's a uh, situation where I think he gets better defensively. And uh, I think his feet work pretty good and there's plenty of arm. Yeah. 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 And then, um, you know, going back to the, the Cubs draft and I'll put it up there again, um, talking about Cole Mathis college of Charleston, that that's a pretty, pretty darn good baseball program. Right. And here's a guy that's just got natural power. Um, you know, right-handed bat, a lot of right-handed bats in this, um, you know, in this top 10 group, but how do you project, power when you see these guys hit aluminum and i know a lot of you guys will cheat and go to the cape just because you want to see what they look like with the wood right <laughs> yeah and uh <laughs> is that cheating it, Tim? It, 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 there's some significance between naturally the aluminum bat and the wood bat and uh it, it, it's a nice get it's more of a comfortable look where you're not bouncing around uh, in most cases, you're there for a week to two weeks and, and watching these players play, and you get a little bit more of an idea how they – some of them have feel for the barrel, others not as much. So it's, uh, it's a good cheat league <laughs> to, to go see those players – and uh, I don't know how many of these guys were playing because they're juniors and probably expected uh, to be drafted. And, and, and two of the other guys were high school in the third and the fourth round. But it was, just, I think it was 40 picks. The Cubs had to wait till their second round pick because of so many uh, comp picks mm -hmm. don't get into that now i'm going to bring no, back i won't i won't I because i know you what you're itching to talk about the comp picks which is a lot different now than it used to be there were compound comp picks a lot in the draft but before we kind of get back to that mathis is also a two-way player right he can pitch and he can hit but they're saying that he's only going to hit professionally is there ever a, like part of you guys you see a, a, a you know, a good two-way player. I'm a, I'm going to do a banquet with Rick and Keel uh, coming up in, in the next week. And and I was thinking about that. Like if he would have came along now that show, Hey, Otani's here, right. Would that have opened the door for some of these guys that can do both? Or are we still stuck in the mindset of you, you can only pitch or hit, but you can't do both. I think it's more of the latter just because of the traditional part of baseball and how much time that they have to spend on both positions. 
uh, especially pitcher because it's it's uh, quite demanding, and and yet you're still trying to maintain playing a position and swinging the bat. So I, you may see it a little bit, and it may increase here in the next two three years, but not to a huge degree. And uh, it's much like the guy that was selected by the Royals with the sixth pick, uh, Jack uh, Caglione. And there's still some people that think that he could pitch on a high level. Right. But it's the same and power it, guy. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and there's some guys that projected that this guy might have 40 home run power. So do you mess with that by sprinkling in the pitching part and uh, does he have the mindset to handle it? And Otani naturally is kind of a freak in that situation. And uh, we'll see what happens with uh, Otani next year. Supposedly he's going to uh, going to try it again on the mound. So, Ronnie Cruz, uh, Miami Christian School, 17 years old, shortstop, was committed to going to Miami. Now he is obviously going to – I guess he's going to sign with the Cubs. I think he would, right? 6'2", 170 pounds, and um, has, you know, a, a lot of ability as far as making contact with the barrel of the bat. When you're scouting guys, and I know you scouted uh, one of the all-time great Cubs who was a high school player out of Florida, a guy by the name of Javi Baez, how do you project what they're going to look like in their man body? Because at 17 years old, you're not what you're going to be when you're 21 or 22 or 25 or whatever. Yeah, it, it's 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 a it's an interesting situation. Javi was probably a little more pronounced physically than most high school players of his age at that time. But, uh, I mean, you're talking about a guy in Cruz that's six foot two and 170 pounds. And I, I'm just guessing I've not seen him, but I'll, I'll bet he's got fairly broad shoulders and probably that frame can handle anywhere from 190 to 200 pounds. So, you're going to be talking about a different guy three, four years down the road. If he's got those good bat to ball skills or ability to hit the barrel, uh, I think that'll show out. And then eventually you're going to see more power from those guys because we're talking anywhere from 20 to 30 pounds of added weight and strength. And uh, they took another high school guy right after that. Not a very big guy. Uh, and uh, I think he's 5'9", 170, a high school player out of Nevada. So um, it, it, it goes from player to player. Uh, we had some talks about guys that were late developers, late growers, like Jonah Heim, Alex Baum, uh, Geraldo Pordomo, uh, those guys all added weight and strength, which I don't think analytics can predict. Yeah, might, I don't either. It, it, it's a sighting from the scouts that, that see this guy, see the families, uh, what they might be able to project for added strength mm -hmm. and weight. Uh, one of the guys that I think is really exciting it, because of the energy he brings is another high school guy, uh, the Cubs' fourth-round pick, uh, Ty Salsini, who's from Nevada. And he actually worked with our buddy Mike Bryant, uh, Chris Bryant's dad, uh, since he was like a, you know a middle school kid on hitting. And I, what I like about him is that he brings a lot of energy. You know, like he's one of these guys like loves baseball, uh, loves to be around the game, kind of Javi Baez like as far as the infectious uh, uh, love for baseball. I remember watching Javi, 6'1", 170, so he's a, he's a high school guy. But I uh, just thought that was cool. Out of Hendersonville, Nevada, Tim, I just got back from Vegas 
So uh, that has <laughs> nothing to do with this other than I'm not hung over anymore. And that's why we're here talking about baseball. <laughs> <laughs> the strip, the strip will, but it'll suck you in, Tim. No comment. <laughs> no comment, Nick. But uh, no, it uh, sounds like he's a, an instinctive player. I don't think they would have been taking a guy that was just tools only there. And he must have showed their scouting staff his ability inside the game, which is that six tool. You know, you have your regular five tools, but he I evidently, just from what I'm reading and seeing and some of the comments you made, that this guy has good baseball ability. And I, I just can't think they would have taken a guy that was tooled up there and you're hoping for something. Mm -hmm. Evidently, he showed him he is a baseball player. All right, final thoughts on the Cubs draft before we talk about the draft overall in general. And mm -hmm. I, I, I guess the first thing to me is two, two questions that I have. You, you don't have many catchers in the Cubs system, and catching is a tough position right now. You took yeah. two catchers of the 20. You took a fifth-round pick and then a guy late in the draft if you're the Cubs. When you guys are in that position where you know the organization is thin in an area, do you focus on that area like a specific position like that and, and and then go after it? Hey, we'll take the best available, you know, catcher in this spot. Or is it something like, hey, here's the guys we have on our board. This guy ought to be around in the fifth round. And if he is, we'll take him. But you're not addressing the issue that you have. You know, how does that how does that work from a scouting perspective as far as scouting director and then putting the whole draft together? Mick, that's a really good question, and I think it goes from year to year. You know, you'll have a deluge of left-handed pitchers in the draft, or so to say, and some years, you know, with this catcher and the other guy they took later on, Armas uh, from University of San Diego, I, I think that you can't force a pick. You know, if you got guys that are on the board that you strongly believe in, then you're going to have to either get that catcher that you're looking for in a trade that year. Maybe next year there's going to be 20 frontline catchers. Wow. That doesn't, that doesn't generally happen. Okay? Right, right, right. But, but at you're the same time. It's hard time, to target a position because you just mm -hmm. that's just not how it works. No, and and like I said, this guy's got to be competitive. And if he doesn't fit your parameters, you can't be forcing a catcher or any other position player that you think you need because of lack of strength in the organization. Right. You can't force that pick. You've got to let it basically come to you and the organization and – uh, I'm just guessing. I've not looked at it catchers wise, but it maybe it was a down year for catchers this year. So well, I feel like it's a down year for catchers all the time now. I mean, I, I just feel yeah. like it's such a tough position to field. And when you were with the Cubs, one of the things that I got to give Jim Hendry and that front office a bunch of credit for was it was tough to find catchers back then. But you would do that, but then you may take a shortstop like a Steve Clevenger or uh, Robinson Torinos and turn him into a catcher. And those guys yeah. got to the big leagues doing that. I will say this. So Nery Fleda, who was the player development guy at that time period when I was the scouting director, he was very open to it, and he was proactive as far as seeing. There, there's a lot of players out there that are very good baseball players, that might be three or four runners on a, on a five scale, five being average. So, but they knew how to play the game. They handled the back good. And O'Neary did that many a times. And uh, it really paid off uh, catching wise for some of those guys that were converted into catchers that were 
mostly infielders. Yeah, right. Most you infielders. really don't see too many outfielders going outfield to behind the plate, but you do see a fair amount. Uh, we had uh, a couple guys over with the Blue Jays that we converted, mainly Pat Borders, but uh, and then we had other guys like Adam Melhus and there were there were guys that they were good baseball players. They were really in tune to the game, and they had enough skill, other than probably in most cases the run tool that you probably need as an infielder. And that's why a lot of those guys were converted behind the plate. How about that? Well, the last Cubs question before we get to the draft in, in general is pitching-wise, right? Because I feel like that's that's definitely, when you go into a draft, something that you're going to highlight, right? I mean, you only took two pitchers in the first 10 picks, took a lot of pitchers late. What's the strategy there, and what are you hoping for if you're the Cubs? Well, I think uh, there's – been a little uh, thought with a lot of the guys that cover the Cubs and are watching the Cubs uh, and the scouts that see the Cubs that perhaps their athleticism uh, big league wise isn't as good as some other clubs and I, I you know it's, it's a little bit of a problem and I, I think by seeing eight out of the first 10, and maybe most of it was natural, but that they might have been pushing the envelope to get a little bit more athletic. Okay. Hey, that makes sense to me. Yeah. And then, you know, they might, might feel like they're going to go by pitching, which has been something that they've strategized mm -hmm. a lot lately. But they've also developed some guys lately too, you know. I mean, you look at the, the pitchers that they have, Justin Steele, hey – Develop that guy. I mean, he's, I think he's legitimately one of the best pitchers in baseball. Uh, Javier Saad, totally developed by the Cubs. No one had thought he was going to be there. Um, Jordan Wicks, when he's healthy, Ben Brown, they traded for him, but they still developed him. I mean, it, he wasn't big league ready when they got him. Uh, but to draft and develop, that's something that the Cubs have really struggled with the pitching department for a while and then i guess in this draft they're like well we feel like we're pretty good there we're going to get more athletic which makes sense to me all yeah, right let's that's, that's just speculation on my part but oh, i got gotcha. you that's kind of my viewpoint and uh, uh i i just think that the meat of the draft seemingly was not uh so much on the pitching side or the catching side but more on uh, middle infielders and some outfielders. Yep, and you can you know you can take all those shortstops, and they can play anywhere else on the diamond. And I know you know that. All right, here's a question. Yes. Yeah, and here's here's a question. Okay, overall thoughts on the draft, right? Mm -hmm. um, first pick in the draft out of Oregon State, a second baseman. At the the minute that they drafted, and they drafted a second baseman. Uh, what is it, Travis? Travis. Bazana. Bazana. Okay. I thought to myself, like, whoa, they just took a second baseman. I didn't realize it was like the first time that, that anybody had ever taken a second baseman as yeah. the first overall pick. Your thoughts? Well, uh, just to give you an idea, in the 10 rounds, I didn't do it all the way to 15. Five second basemen were taken in the first 10 rounds. Wow. Or basically eleven rounds because of all the comp picks. So only five second basemen, and I'm I'm having a hard time thinking to myself. Other than when I was an area guy and I had nothing to do with it, but we took Jeff Kent, who was a second baseman, third baseman type. He played shortstop in college for a while, but. Generally, you don't see many guys reaching up and drafting second basemen, especially high in the draft. Why? I, I don't know. I, maybe it's the allure of what shortstops can bring you, and as you alluded to earlier, that they can probably play a few other positions besides shortstop. Second base, I don't think you're thinking that way. So evidently, this hit tool 
and Cleveland thought, hey, this is going to go fast. He's got a real good chance to hit in the big leagues, and we don't care if it's second base, blah, blah, blah. So, like you said earlier, first one ever. And, I mean, we've had, uh, what, 60 years of the draft now. Mm -hmm. Well, I I thought this, Tim. I was on a show the other day, and they asked me, and I I said, you know, I I think the reason why – just my thoughts, but I think the reason why is that if you play second base, then you're limited, right? You're not playing third because you probably don't have the arm for that. You're not playing short because you probably don't have the range for that. You know, second base to me is the easiest defensive position to play on the field. Not saying it's easy, but I'm just saying, I think first base is harder to play because you got to pick all the throws. And if you don't block the ball at first base, your team, your infield defense is going to be bad, right? Shortstop, toughest position on the field because you got to have arm and range, and you also have to have good instincts. Third's a tough position. I played that one. That one's the one that's tough because, first off, you're getting the ball smashed at you, so you better be quick. And then the other thing is you better have a good arm because you got to make long throws across the diamond. Catcher's probably the second toughest position. You know, I mean, you're you're directing the the team. And the uh, that you're working with the pitcher, you got to know the batters, you know, you got to block the ball, all that stuff. And then center field is the toughest outfield spot, corner outfield spots. I'd say probably the second easiest positions left field. And then, uh, you know, right field, you got to have a good arm. But, but all in all, second base to me, it feels like when you're a second baseman, I in my mind, there's just no other place to put you, and you better be able to hit if you're not very good defensively. Well, and evidently that's what Cleveland thought when they took him. I know other organizations and people in those organizations talked about this guy's ability to hit. And, uh, you know, I I think that's where Cleveland came to the thought they're going to take a second baseman, which we've never seen before. So really interesting in that sense. But uh, I've got to think that they've got him projected as a 60, maybe a 70 hitter. And they say he runs decent enough. And uh, it sounds like he's got pretty good baseball ability. So they could fill in uh, even though it was at second base. And I just got to think they thought he was at least a 60, maybe a 70 hitter on an 80 grade scale. Well, he walks a lot. And then when he hits the ball, I mean, he hits for a bunch of power and extra base Mm -hmm. hits and stuff. So he's got a great- not only second baseman, but Australian. Yeah, so. yeah. How about that, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I get the vibe that you would have taken a second baseman. If you thought that the second baseman was the right pick, you wouldn't care. No, I don't think you do. And like I said earlier, Cleveland's got to have the mindset this guy can really hit. Yeah, he's got to hit. There, All right. There's there's no other way you're gonna take this guy unless he's got a, a projectable 60 bat or, or a 70 bat on an 80 scale. So that that's the only thing I can come close to saying other than baseball player wise, I'm sure he's a real good baseball player and we don't have a grading scale for baseball players, but this guy might've been a 60 at least mm-hmm. uh, from what I can ascertain here. All right, uh, final question, and I got a, uh, a a comment that someone wanted me to ask, or a question that somebody wanted me to ask you. So comp picks, very different now. You know, you get comp picks for rookie of the year. You get comp picks for doing other stuff. I love it, Tim. I love it. I love that you get rewarded for playing players that are young, you know, because for years it was like you got rewarded for leaving them in the minor leagues. And um, that was different in this draft, though, because all of a sudden teams would just pop up in the middle of nowhere and be like, ah, oh, the end of the second round, here's three comp picks, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there were, like I told you earlier, uh, there were 43 comp picks. So that's basically a whole round and a half after the first round. So basically those second rounders you are getting in most – uh, yearly situations in the draft, uh, that second round uh, probably is a third round or later. Yep. 
All right, this is the question, Tim. I'm going to try to read this. It's from Joe. He said, hey, Mick, can you ask Tim about what the Cub, Cubs did to Schwarber and Hap as his leadoff replacement W? This uh, C pitches per at bat, get on base twice a game. Basically, I think what he's asking is when you get these guys drafted and then they start developing them, and they're like, hey, we want you to get on base. We want you to take pitches. All of a sudden, your power numbers go down. Your ability to hit for clutch goes down. You know, how, 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 does, that, how does that work? I mean, like, how, how, does, how does all that stuff, when you give a guy, you draft a guy like Schwarbs or, or Hap or whoever else, and then you send them over? Yeah. First of all, on Schwarber, when I was with the Cubs and we selected Schwarber, I really thought he was going to be at least a 60 hitter. Uh, he showed more willingness to hit the ball the other way as an amateur. And I would say in the last three, four, maybe five years, he's got very pull conscious. He can still hit the ball the other way, but I don't think, that he goes opposite field like he used to, especially his amateur years at University of Indiana. Uh, on Hap's case, Hap was more athletic, uh, possibly than Schwarber. I, although I thought Schwarber ran okay mm -hmm. when he first signed. Uh, Hap maybe was a little more well-rounded, but uh, – Hap's uh, power naturally is uh, not like Schwarber, but I I personally thought Hap was going to end up as a corner outfielder. Uh, there was some thought in the room that he could play second base, but I didn't believe that. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyways, uh, I mean, very good baseball player, uh, pretty good uh, cog for – uh, his club as far as he fills in that lineup pretty good. And uh, I don't know. I, but like I said, I was, I've was i been kind of surprised about Schwarber here, like I said, in the last five or six years because he seems to be pull versus hitting the ball the other way. Yeah, which is what I saw too. Right? Like the, this guy, we, the guy could have hit 340 if he would have just hit the ball instead of worrying about the home runs, right? Well, I, I thought you were still going to get a, a, your fair share of home runs. I just thought he was going to be at least a 60, pushing a 70 hitter. And you still could have got 25 to 30 home runs out of him if he had maintained that approach and that swing that he had earlier as a, both as an amateur and professional going into the big leagues. So – well, Tim, yep. you did it. You did it. We did it. And um, it was fun. These shows yeah. go by fast, don't they? You didn't think it was going to go by this fast, did you? No, Mick. I, I got one other question for you. Go ahead. Or, well, I got two two other statements, if I can make it. Go ahead. Go ahead, Tim. First of all, we had 615 picks in the 20 rounds. And 507 of those players for, were from east of the Rockies. So there's something really going on out west. And maybe it's just one of those years where there wasn't huge injection of talent and, you know, everyday players and pitchers that came out of the west. And I think it was very noteworthy because, uh, you know, for years, California has uh, led the country in most picks. This year, they had the most. They, they had six more than the state of Florida. They had 63. Florida had 57. And then Texas, uh, North Carolina, 46, and Texas, 40. So I, I think there's been a shift of the talent and uh, – We'll see if that becomes a trend here in the next few years. Yeah, no doubt. All right, anything else? No, uh, unless you want to guess the fifth of the ten states of uh, players drafted. 
Let's do so, it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. Uh, the so, fifth one was. Uh, well, let me guess. Let me guess first. Okay. All right. Let me guess. I'm going to say. I gave you three. All right. So I'm going to say these are the five states that the most players came from. California, Texas, Georgia. Uh, Georgia, Georgia was eighth. Eighth? No way. Really? Yeah, money. Yep. Okay. So Texas, California, Florida. They're in the top. They're in the top five. Then where would the other three be? Hmm. Uh, might be somewhere where you're kind of employed. Uh, uh, oh, Tennessee. Yeah, they were fifth at twenty-two. Wow. Okay. And then wow. you had uh, right after that, you had uh, two other states. Uh, well, Georgia, I told you, was eight. South Carolina seventh with twenty-one. Mm-hmm. And Mississippi, 8th at 20, Alabama, 19, and Illinois and Kentucky had 17 apiece. Wow. Okay. Well, cool, man. That's awesome. All right. Well, look, we, we, put, it in the, we put it in the books. Let's do it again soon. Yes, we'd love to. And uh, uh, kind of, like you said, the, the, the Christmas Day for Scouts uh, – was the last three days and uh now it's uh they're gonna have to go out and find guys for 2025 that's right and congratulations to all of those teams because we know they watch we know they watch we're the ones that talk about them this is the mlb <laughs> baseball scout podcast so congratulations to all of you scouts that got it done get back out there and do it again yeah. tim wilkin I'm Mick Gillespie. Thanks for hanging with us. Like and subscribe. Give us a thumbs up. We'll talk to you guys again really soon.